Um, just an announcement about the films today. Um, at 13.15 is Song for Emily, Karen Zoid. And at half past three this afternoon is Regeneration, um, which is a film based on the book by Pat Barker, The First World War. Um, should be very good. Today we're going to be looking at fiction. Um, there's one replacement. I decided to use Garrison Keylor's Lake Wobegon Days um, instead of the other, but I'd actually recommend all his books. In the winter school feedback in August last year, there was a request for translations and the literature of other countries. So I thought I would make this the focus on excellent, good, um, little-known literature from other countries. Every time I travel, I try to find the literature of a particular country, because we simply don't see that in the bookshops. And one of the pleasures of the book club I belong to is that a lot of the members travel, and say if they come back from Morocco, they bring back um, Moroccan fiction. Um, or Sri Lankan fiction, and it's a, a wonderful way of discovering entire bodies of literature and authors um, that we didn't know about. The first one I'm going to start with is Tove Janssen, The Summer Book. Now, she was the creator of the Moomins, um, which you may know through translations for children. And um, she'll always be remembered for the Moomins, but her adult books are no less magical. This is a translation. It's one of ten books that she wrote for adults. Uh, she uh, died a few years ago, um, but she was born in 1914 in Helsinki. And she grew up as part of a Swedish-speaking Finnish minority. And she became known for her satirical cartoon work, the movements that was particularly anti-Nazi. She skated quite a, a thin line. But she and her partner, um, the artist and professor Tulika Piatilla, spent their winters in Helsinki. Um, and until they were too old to do so, they spent their summers on unpopulated small islands in the Gulf of Finland. And the summer book is an extraordinary book that is set on one of these islands um, in a summer. There are 26 vignettes, exquisitely written. Um, she distills the essence of summer, its sunlight and its storms, it tells the story of Sophia, a six-year-old girl, and this is based on Tove Janssen's niece and mother. Sophia is awakening to existence, and Sophia's grandmother is nearing the end of hers, and they spend the, uh, the summer together on this tiny, unspoiled island in the Gulf of Finland. The grandmother is unsentimental and wise, if a little cranky, Sophia is impetuous and volatile, but she tends to her grandmother with the care of the new parent. Together they amble over coastline and forest in easy companionship. They build boats from bark. They create a miniature Venice. They write a fanciful study of local bugs. They discuss things that matter to young and old alike. Life, death, the nature of God and of love. In its opening chapter, the old woman and the small child wander the island talking about all manner of things, such as death. When are you going to die? Will they dig a hole? The child asks amiably. Or how best to dive into water? With your eyes open, of course, the grandmother tells her. The grandmother loses her false teeth and finds them again. The child wants to go swimming. Quoting, she waited for opposition, but none came. So she took off her clothes slowly and nervously. She glanced at her grandmother. You can't depend on people who just let things happen. <laughs> it's deep, Sophia thought. 
she forgets I've never swum in deep water unless someone was with me. And she climbed out again and sat on a rock. The old woman, weary with age, sitting still because she doesn't want to lose her balance, silently notes it. This child is still afraid of deep water. The child's mother is dead, but this is never mentioned directly. The death is marked only momentarily when the child wakes up in a bed she doesn't have to share anymore after a bad dream of luggage floating away in the moonlight. All the suitcases were open and full of darkness and moss. The loss, never mentioned again, haunts the book. Meanwhile, it was just the same long summer always, and everything lived and grew at its own pace. The grandmother and the child talk, fight, curse each other, have adventures, make things, and break into the new summer house on the neighboring island because they're outraged that the businessman who built it has locked it instead of leaving it open as everybody else does in the Gulf. The child's father, a strong presence because of his general absence, off doing more important things, fades in and out of the narrative that is by turn hilarious and moving. There is act after act of kindness. It would be easy to be sentimental here. Janssen never is. The child is intransigent. The old woman is always on the cusp of tiredness. She's constantly dizzy, fearful of losing her balance in a landscape where the balance between survival and extinction was so delicate that even the smallest change was unthinkable. The threat of brevity, even on this timeless island, in this timeless, gorgeous summer, is very marked. But Janssen's brilliance is to create a narrative that seems, at least, to have no forward motion, to exist in lit moments, gleaming dark moments, like lights on a string, each chapter its own beautifully constructed, random-seeming, complete story. Her writing is all magical deception, her sentences simple and loaded. The novel reads like looking through clear water and seeing, suddenly, the depth. Highly recommended. It's superb. This was one of the books I found when I went to Indonesia in May last year. It was surprisingly difficult to find literature from Indonesia, uh, because Indonesia has 700 languages. So quite a bit of the writing is done in the local languages. And the few books that are translated are generally translated into Dutch, because Indonesia used to belong to Holland. So there's very little available in English. But this one is quite a remarkable book. It's by Andrea Herata, The Rainbow Troops. Um, it's an autobiographical novel. It sold five million copies. It's a best known book in Indonesia. I think he wrote it in the sort of lingua franca and then it's been translated into um, many languages. It's about a group of students who continually overcome great odds to attend school so that they can sometime pull themselves out of the abject poverty into which they've been born. A film has recently been made of it. These are some of the scenes from the film. And it's become Indonesia's highest grossing movie of all time. Um, and it's been translated into 21 languages. Set on the island of Belitung, off the coast of Sumatra, the story begins when Ikal, who's actually the author's alter ego, enrolls at the Humada Dia School, the poorest village school on the island, which is housed in a building that he describes, if bumped by a frenzied goat preparing to mate, would collapse and fall to pieces. The schoolhouse has a roof with leaks so large that students would see planes flying in the sky and have to hold umbrellas while studying on rainy days. 
These hardships do not deter the initial 10 students, later christened the Rainbow Troops, from attending school each day. They range in age and ability and are driven to succeed largely due to the unflagging efforts of their teachers, Pak Ha Fan and Bu Muz, neither of whom receives any remuneration. These are the characters in the film of the two fanatically dedicated teachers. Together they embody an example that underlies the entire story, that the pursuit of education transcends everything. The members of the Rainbow Troops know only hardship. Their fathers are largely coolies who work for PN Tima, the state-owned tin company that has capitalized on Belitung's huge mineral deposits, which have made it the richest, rich, richest island in Indonesia. There's no trickle-down of wealth, however. He writes, the Indonesian government took over PN from the colonial Dutch, and not only were the assets seized, but also the feudalistic mentality. The people of this rich island are therefore like a pack of starving rats in a barn full of rice. The book's most compelling character is the brilliant Lin Tang, the son of an illiterate fisherman whose passion for school sees him cycling an 80-kilometer round-trip journey every day past crocodile-infested swamps. Despite his being an obvious mathematical genius, he's forced to give up his education when his father dies in an accident and take over his role as the family's breadwinner. Eichel says, which is the theme of the book, we had learnt the spirit of giving as much as possible, not taking as much as possible. That mentality made us always grateful, even in poverty. Despite the poverty, there's an extraordinary joyousness in the book, an enjoyment of life, despite everything. It's not a work of great literature, but the story feels real, clearly written by someone who has lived that life. The themes that infuse the book's narrative are political without being polemic or preachy. They set amidst a backdrop that highlights corporate rapaciousness, economic inequality, and religious syncretism. This gives it a resonance beyond Indonesia and a universality. It's well worth reading. Next one from India is Amitov Ghosh, and I chose his book about Burma, the Glass Palace. He's written a number of books. He's experimented with the novel as form. I think in some of the later books, he kind of lost his audience because he was experimenting with language to such a large degree. But he is a natural storyteller. He's a bit like Stieg Larsson. You know, the, the writing might not be the highest literary quality, but it's an absolute page turner. You just can't help turning the pages to find out what's going to happen next. He's actually won countless prizes. Um, and in fact, for the Glass Palace, um, he won the Booker Prize, and he was famous for refusing to accept it because it was being, in fact, it was, sorry, the, um, the Commonwealth Prize. And he rejected it because it, um, he disagreed with the notion of Commonwealth and um, colonialism. He has one of the most arresting openings in recent fiction in this book. In the marketplace of Mandalay, only an 11-year-old Indian boy, Raj Kumar, recognizes the booming sounds beyond the curve of the river as English cannon fire. The year is 1885, and the British have used a trade dispute over timber to justify the invasion and seizure of Burma's capital. It was not a glorious moment in British history. As a crowd of looters pours into the fabled glass palace, the dazzling throne room of the nine-roofed golden spire that was the hiti of Burma's kings, this is the royal palace, this is the throne room, 
with the mirrors on the walls, the royal barge, and the royal carriage. Rajkumar catches sight of Dolly, then only ten, nursemaid to the second princess. And although this is not <coughs> Dolly, this is one of the Burmese princesses with her nursemaid. This is Queen Supalayat and King Tobo, the last king and queen of Burma, in full ceremonial dress. And these are some photographs of the Burmese upper nobles, uh, upper classes, nobles from that time. Raj Kumar carries the memory of this brief meeting with Dolly through the years to come, while he raises to fame and riches in the teak trade, and Dolly travels into exile to India with King Tabor, Burma's last queen, king, the queen and their three daughters. The story of the exiled king and his family in Ratnagiri, a sleepy port town south of Bombay, is worth a novel in itself. And it's particularly scandalous as the princesses grow up, they're isolated from everyone, and one of them manages secretly to fall in love with what's basically a, a watchman at the gate. Low class, um, and the family is absolutely horrified, but she marries him and is very happy with him. The British have parked the royal family in the sleepy port town because they don't want publicity, they don't want people visiting them, and they basically cut them off. Inspired by tales handed down to him by his father and his uncle, Gosh vividly brings to life the history of Burma and Malaya over a century of momentous change in this teeming multi-generational multi saga with an expanding range of characters. He's one of the many Indian writers who've emerged in the 1980s. <coughs> but he's among the very few to have expressed in his work a developing awareness of the aspirations, defeats, and disappointments of colonized people as they work out their place in the world. There isn't easy politics or sermonizing in his work at all. It's very subtle. But there is instead a concern for the individual, a curiosity about the working of alien societies and often an honest examination of colonial neuroses as well as an even-handed description of the viewpoints of opposing sides, such as during the Second World War, when although India and Burma as, Br as British colonies were allies of Britain, there was a very strong independence movement within both countries that decided to throw in their lot with Japan in the hopes that this would help get them independence. So he shows a family that is split between the Indian Independence Army and the British um, Army and the kind of tensions that arose out of that. Um, Aung San Kyi's father was one of the Burmese um, leaders who threw in his lot with the Japanese, thinking that they would free them from the yoke of the British only to discover that the Japanese were even worse than the British. Just before his death, Gosh writes, Arjun has a vision of the empire as a huge indelible stain which has tainted all of us and which we cannot destroy without destroying ourselves. And this vision stays with the reader. But much of that analysis is exceptionally subtle Along the way, there's a description of the evolving societies and economies. He goes into the industry of logging, anthrax, anthrax elephants, rubber, the emerging um, photography, and cars, which give a rich and detailed view of life in Southeast Asia over the century. And the book moves between India, Burma, across the, the Gulf. It's extraordinary to realize just how much movement there was. It's absolutely riveting storytelling with a very subtle message. <coughs> From India, I'm recommending Ruth Prawa Jabvala. Um, and I just happen to have chosen this book of short stories, How I Became a Holy Mother. But she actually wrote the book Heat and Dust, A Love Song for India 
and she has a whole body of work. She really is a superb writer. She was born in Germany to Polish parents, um, but was brought up uh, in Germany and Europe. And she became involved in a collaboration with Merchant and Ivory. Um, and she, a highly successful collaboration of film producer, film director, and scriptwriter. She was the scriptwriter. She wrote over 22 scripts for them. And she's the only person in the world who has won both an Oscar for a script and a Booker Prize for her writing. And here are scenes from the film Heat and Dust uh, with Sashi Kapoor and Greta Sachi and Julie Christie, who's not shown in these photographs. You probably all saw A Room with a View that she also wrote the script for. Um, and Howard's End, a long list of credits. But her short stories um, and her novels are really about life in India. She married um, a Parsi architect and moved to India and lived there. And so she writes about the ordinary people of India, the, the widows, um, uh, the daily life, those who marginalized by society. Her early works dwell on the themes of romantic love and arranged marriages, and their portraits of the social mores, idealism, and chaos of the early decades of independent India. Writing of her in the New York Times, the novelist Mishra observed that she was probably the first writer in English to see that India's westernizing middle class, so preoccupied with marriage, lent itself well to Jane Austenish comedies of manners. Her literary works were well received, described as the highest art, a balance between subtlety, humor, and beauty, and as being Chekhovian in the detached sense of comic self-delusion. She was initially assumed to be Indian because she wrote with such understanding and subtlety of Indian ways of thought and expression and social life, um, her sense of humor is immensely dry and sly, and it's there all the time. She writes about family tensions, love triangles, and assorted trials of village life in bittersweet domestic scenes in modern India. She concentrates on the quiet exchanges that leave much unsaid on gestures and manners that mask inner feelings. And in many of the stories, the point of view is that of the protagonist, who through thoughts, words, and deals, deeds, reveals that he or she completely misunderstands what is actually happening in the story. So in the short story, A Star on Two Girls, two young English girls are being entertained by an Indian film star um, he thinks he's giving them this enormous gift and that he's impressing them, but the more he boasts, actually you realize the more alienated they are. Trying too hard to impress them, he says, rather desperately using a loud, wide awake voice to rouse them. Yesterday we saw my new rushes. Everybody said they were wonderful. This is going to be a big hit. Everyone said. What fun, said Gwen. He felt uncomfortable. Was she laughing at him? But her eyes, as she looked at him unblinkingly, were clear and frank. In the short story On Bail, the innocent wife of an arrested fraudster and thief lives in a world of denial, believing what her husband Raji tells her. She writes, Next evening, of course, he is off again, but I don't mind, for I know it is necessary, not only because he is a very sociable person, but it is for business contacts also. <laughs> Whereas he's actually out having affairs. And she resumes her customary platitudes, except for one screaming outburst when reality breaks through and she finds him sleeping with her friend Sudha in the bedroom. 
But the story twists, and more of the backstory is very skillfully revealed, which changes the reader's perception of it, when you discover in one, in one casual sentence that she had actually pinched him from Sudha, <laughs> who was made to enter an arranged marriage. And then again in the final paragraph, there's another one sentence twist. Very, very skillful. The title story, How I Became a Holy Mother, features a fashion model who's now two marriages into her 20s, who finds peace in an ashram with an easygoing guru, and the pair of them perform religiously for the multitudes when not making love in the ashram. <laughs> and she's found peace and contentment, but in a completely unexpected way. These are 10 stories, muted in tone, strong in texture, searing intelligence and insight combined with the most effortless prose reveal Jabthala's brilliance. In my view, she's one of the best writers in English in the last century. <coughs> the next book is by Chris Berjalian, uh, the Sandcastle Girls, and I found it when I went to um, Armenia in 2013 and was looking for books to read, and this was a national bestseller in America, it got onto the New York Times bestselling list. I have to say, until I went to Armenia, I had only a very hazy idea of the Armenian genocide that occurred in 1915. In fact, one and a half million people were massacred by the Turks. And it didn't come to the attention of the world because the First World War was going on at the time. And uh, Germany and Britain, uh, Turkey and Germany were allies, and Germany wasn't terribly concerned about what Turkey was doing on its western borders. In fact, it was annexing, annexing most of Armenia. They um, killed all the, rounded up and killed all the intellectuals in Istanbul throughout um, uh, what is now Turkey, what was then um, western Armenia, and drove one and a half million Armenians into the Syrian desert to die. It's a subject of um, Chris Bajelian's 14th novel, and it was inspired by his parents, his grandparents' background. This actually is the Holocaust Memorial in Yerevan in Armenia. It's the city of Yerevan in the background, um, sort of a wall of remembrance sacred fire, and the gardener in me recognized what are probably very old Persian roses planted all over the place. Um, and there are boards to the memory of people who die. They try to trace as, as many as possible. Inspired by his grandparents' background, the author explores the suffering and atrocities of that time with astounding precision, compassion, and grace. How do a million and a half people die with nobody knowing, ponders Laura Petrosian, the book's modern-day narrator. The answer, she will discover, is really very simple. You kill them in the middle of nowhere. And in the middle of an international war that is taking place elsewhere, Laura embarks on a search to find out more about her Boston grandmother and her Armenian grandfather who met during the slaughter and about which she knew very little. Then the story flashes back to 1915 when Boston magnate Silas Endicott brought his daughter Elizabeth with him to Aleppo on a small philanthropic expedition. Their mission was to deliver food and supplies to survivors, and they were part of the Quaker movement who tried to provide relief in troubled spots of the world. Elizabeth, a recent graduate with a rudimentary knowledge of Armenian, plans to chronicle what she sees for their organization, Friends of Armenia, 
and she plans to volunteer at the local hospital. But within minutes of arriving and meeting the American consul, they come across a staggering column of women who are all completely naked, bare from their feet to the long drapes of matted black hair. Their skin has been seared black by the sun or stained by the soil in which they've slept, or in some cases by great yawning scabs and wounds that are open and festering. They are being herded through the town by Turkish soldiers before being marched east, supposedly to be placed in camps, a word that the consul says is a misnomer. I am told that slaughterhouse is more apt. Among these desperate deportees, Elizabeth befriends a woman named Navat and the young orphan she has saved. This is Hatun, says Navat. Like me, she is unkillable. Having witnessed her own mother's beheading, Hatun is virtually mute. And Navat's generosity towards the child is a poignant reminder of kindness and courage set against the inhuman acts being perpetrated around them. A few days after arriving in Aleppo, Elizabeth and her father are in a restaurant with a consul when an Armenian engineer named Armin enters with two German soldiers. Germany and Turkey are allies, one of the trio explains as they begin talking. But alarmed by what their ally is doing to the Armenians, these Germans are secretly taking photographs, although they know it is illegal. It is espionage. It is treasonous. The consul urges them to get the pictures out or give them to him. And this is based on fact. There are photographs of what was happening. We want to be sure that Americans know how dire the situation here has become, Elizabeth tells Armin the next day. And as their friendship moves towards romance, Elizabeth learns that Armin has lost his wife and baby daughter in the slaughter. I need to do something, he tells her. I can't be a bystander to all this. I can't die a sheep. And what he does next will change their lives. It's actually the story of Bajalian's grandparents and how they met. And he deftly weaves the many threads of the story back and forth from past to present, from abuse to humanity, from devastation to redemption. And his ability to add irony and wit makes the contrasting horrors even more intense. It's a page turner, well, on a Kindle, uh, and it had me absolutely mesmerized on the flight to Armenia. Another book um, that I came across very recently um, when I went to Ethiopia is by Camilla Gibb called Sweetness in the Belly. When I read it, I actually thought that the writer, what, it was sort of semi-autobiographical, um, because I couldn't believe that the writer could have such an understanding of Islam and of the way of life in Ethiopia. But she's Canadian. Um, it's her third book. It's um, won a number of prizes. Um, the Scotiabank Giller Prize in 2005, and the Trillium Award um, for the best book in Ontario in 2006. And it switches in time between a council estate in London where Ethiopian refugees gather and Harar, which is a medieval <coughs> um, Islamic city in Ethiopia. These are some of the photographs that I took of Harar when we were there. This is part of the... Um, the sort of pathways, cobbled ways between the houses, um, myrrh and incense um, for sale in the market, and a particularly beautiful woman are posted at the coffee ceremony. This was a meal that we were given, and this is one of the books mentioned in the street called The Street of the Sewing Machines. And outside all the little doors are men with treadle singer sewing machines um, acting as tailors, and their customers sit beside them while the garment is made or repaired. And 
it's, it gives me goose flesh to walk through a place where I'm reading about it at the same time and to actually see the spicy food or the bread um, or the streets that they walk. In the book, Lily is a white Muslim woman who was actually the daughter of hippies who were murdered in Morocco, leaving her orphaned, age eight, in the care of the Sufi in charge of the local shrine. And he treats her like a daughter. He teaches her the Quran, and she becomes a, a good Muslim. But eight years later, when she's 16, trouble breaks out in Morocco, and he sends her with um, another companion, Muhammad, to Ethiopia, to Harar, to safety. And she's sort of thrown on the mercy of people. She lives with a very poor woman in Harar. And um, she has to work for her living, so she starts to teach the Quran to the poor children in the houses around her. They have no education. The local Imman is very opposed to this. Uh, he's one of the sort of breed of um, not quite jihad um, Islam, but it's a different breed of Islam to the one that she's been taught. And one of the things that really lingered with me in this book was how her faith sustains her. And she has learnt from her Moroccan guardian how to read the Quran and look at the layers of meaning below the words. And she says, the jihad is the jihad within you between good and evil. It is not a jihad outside. So it's quite a remarkable um, look at the an interpretation of the Quran. Lily switches between differently impoverished locations where her identity is tested. Um, hers is a story of female communities where women not only work, cook, give birth, and apply makeup, but also circumcise their daughters, select husbands, and fight for legitimacy. In Harar, Lily's white skin defines her as a Ferengi, a foreigner, and her education in the Quran isolates her further, but she gains acceptance through teaching it to poor children. She falls in love with a local doctor, Aziz, who is himself an outsider because of his exceptionally dark skin and the fact that he's half Sudanese. And the simmering, unspoken nature of their relationship is a sensuously written undercurrent running through the novel. When famine strikes Ethiopia and the political climate shifts from relative tolerance to the fall of Haile Selassie and the rise of the militaristic Derg government, along with other refugees, Lily flees to London, where she spends agonized years speculating on Aziz's fate. In London, she not only becomes a nurse, but also with her Ethiopian friend, Amina, she sets up an agency to reconnect refugee Ethiopians, which is how Amina discovers her husband, Yusuf, who's been damaged by torture and incarceration by the Der government. Scarred Yusuf, increasingly westernized Amina, grieving Lily, now wooed by a Hindu doctor, reflect the pain, the cultural relocation, and the uncertainty of tribal, political, and religious refugees the world over. Gibbs's territory is urgently modern and controversial, but she enters it softly with grace, integrity, and a lovely, compassionate story. It's a poem to belief and to the displaced, it's humane, resonant, original, and impressive. Bernadine Evaristo in The Guardian says, Gibbs's astonishing use of sensory detail is vibrant and palpable. Likewise, on the council estate in London, which is suffused with incense burning over coals, coffee beans roasting in tin plates and spiced with cardamom. This is a profound novel exploring themes of female circumcision, politics, war, tribalism, yet it's also an exquisite homage to Islam. Some of the most beautiful passages are about Lily's faith. 
Islam is her guiding force as she seeks to discover the true meaning of compassion in today's world. It was a book that lingered with me for days. And I probably bored my companions by talking about it. Another book about refugees. This one won the Pulitzer Prize in 1993. It's by Robert Olin Butlin, called A Good Scent from a Strange Mountain. It's a collection of short stories. And he's quite an interesting character. He speaks Vietnamese. He was a linguist with the American army who fell in love with Vietnam. And he was used as an interpreter and a translator. He was also an intelligence agent. And if you go on the internet, um, there's also quite an entertaining story about his five marriages. Um, and the fourth one sort of burst into the newspapers um, with he and his wife trading insults. Um, but quite apart from that, it's a remarkable ability, like Camilla Gibb, to enter under the skin of another culture um, and to portray what it is like to be Vietnamese in America, to see America through Vietnamese eyes. In the aftermath of the Vietnam War, Viet numerous Vietnamese immigrants settled in Lake Charles, Louisiana, drawn by a climate that was similar to that of their lost nation. The community they form in this new world gives the 15 stories of Butler's collection a sort of novelistic unity, enhanced by his sharp insight at conveying their beliefs and their reactions to life among strangers in a strange land. They're the work of a writer who's intoxicated by Vietnam and the Vietnamese who loves what has alienated so many other Americans, the strange lingual tones, the ambu ambiguity of relations in an ancient and complex society, the teeming nighttime streets of Saigon. Mr. Butler makes the characters completely original with quirky interests and odd, odd obsessions as distinct from one another as the Americans that they brush against. There's the Saigon bar girl in the story Fairy Tale, who comes to America as the wife of an American diplomatic functionary. Their first marriage is do, do, this first marriage is doomed to failure, but a second fulfills her dream to be an American housewife with a toaster machine. There's a Vietnamese couple on a trip to Puerto Vallarta who learned to deal with the other American couples who also won the trip as game show contestants. <coughs> In preparation, a woman readying her friend's corpse for burial combs and envies the beautiful hair that she combed and envied when they were girls in Saigon. She remembers what a delicacy apples were in Saigon and thinks how, like apples in America, sex has become too abundant.